The sun can give life, but it can also destroy. And the coronavirus may not be impervious to its power. A ray of hope in a beam of ultraviolet light. It can help, but it can also harm. Scientists are working on ways to make it safer for people. At a time where there's still no cure or vaccine for COVID-19, can UV light illuminate a way out of a global pandemic? Big question. Welcome to our COVID-19 special here on DW News. I'm Monica Jones in Berlin. Good to have you with us. Now, the case numbers are falling in Europe, but we don't know for sure if the warm weather is killing off the virus or if it's just taking a break. We shouldn't take chances, but we could learn from the sun and its powerful UV light. They start work when the shops close. It's safer if they don't come in direct contact with staff or customers. These little robots are coronavirus assassins. Their weapon is UVC light. UVC is the only known way in which you can disinfect the air. So as you know, COVID-19 uh, lasts in the air for a couple of hours, right? Other forms, if you wipe down, it's just wiping down the surface. You can't wipe the air, right? UVC light can kill 99% of all pathogens in the air and is very effective at disinfecting surfaces. Similar robots are being used in subways and buses, like here in Argentina. Ultraviolet light is the light that the sun emits naturally. In this case, we use type C, which is very high energy and works by destroying the DNA of the bacteria and the RNA in the case of viruses, thus avoiding propagation or spread. UVC light kills all microorganisms, but does not occur naturally. It has to be generated artificially. The sun produces UVA, B and C light. The C light is filtered out by the Earth's atmosphere. Otherwise, there would be no life on Earth. Doctors advise against exposing yourself to direct UVC light. It's the most powerful level of ultraviolet light there is and is especially dangerous for the skin and eyes. And for more, let's bring in Dr. Charlotte Holtcroft. She's a virologist at Cambridge Infectious Diseases and Interdisciplinary Research Centre at the University of Cambridge. Good to have you with us. Uh, could we start, uh, first of all, uh, looking at the virus itself? What happens to a virus when it's exposed to UVC? So a number of different um, chemicals or germicidal treatments can be used to try and disrupt viruses on surfaces. And UVC specifically mutates the genetic material of viruses. And it works, um, it works particularly well when the virus genome is smaller, so fewer letters in the genetic code. And that particularly applies to the new coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, which is 30,000 base pairs long. And does the UVC then render the virus inactive, uh, but still alive, uh, or does it actually destroy it completely? So it's rendering it inactive, so incapable of infecting new cells, incapable of causing new infections. But if you looked for its genetic material on a surface after UVC treatment, I would expect that you would still be able to find some of the genetic material there. You just wouldn't be able to find infectious particles, which is what we really care about. Right. So in, in, this, uh, in this fight against the current pandemic, how effective is UVC when used against SARS-CoV-2? There's still only limited evidence um, of the usefulness of UVC against SARS-CoV-2 specifically. It certainly can be used to deactivate or inactivate other similar viruses um, from the same coronavirus family. Um, but there are also risks associated with UVC treatment. It's particularly toxic to humans. It can cause cataracts. It can cause skin cancer. So there are there are costs and benefits associated with using UVC for virus inactivation. 
Right, so what we saw in this report uh, that UVC is mostly used uh, like in buses uh, at night when they don't run, when there's no people in it. Uh, but how big a chance do you think there is for UVC killing off the virus, let's say in school classrooms as kids are returning to schools, offices, shopping malls? So all those enclosed places, rooms that, that actually were part of our daily lives before the pandemic hit. UVC is certainly one option for deactivating viruses on surfaces in, ex in enclosed spaces. One of the problems is that you require specialist equipment, in this case specialist bulbs, to make the UVC light that would need to be installed in all of these places. You only get inactivation of the virus on surfaces that are hit directly by the light. So anything that's in the shade of another object um, would not have successful viral killing. So I think UVC is only going to be one tool alongside classical um, classical options for killing the viruses on surfaces, such as very good surface cleaning with, with soap and water or with ethanol or with other household disinfectants. So UVC is part of the solution, but it is not the solution uh, in itself. Now, of course, we know that some coronaviruses exactly. are seasonal, like the annual flu. And indeed, case numbers here in Europe, where, where summer is approaching, you can feel it in the air, are falling. Does this mean that SARS-CoV-2 is also affected by warmth and sunlight? Yes, there's good evidence to show that um, natural UV wavelengths that come from sunlight uh, are quite effective at inactivating uh, the new coronavirus. Um, a study was done simulating the amount of UV that you'd get from midday sun in Spain in, uh, in the middle of the year, around the time of year that we have now, showing that midday sun in Spain um, would inactivate the virus on services after about seven minutes. And at that kind of latitude, even in December, in bright sunlight, you would see the virus inactivated after about 15 minutes. So we will find that over the summer, there's less infectious viruses on the surfaces that we might all be touching in the open air. But actually, um, it's likely that the, the natural distancing that people are taking part in during the summer is, is one of the most effective ways of stopping the spread of the virus. We're all spread out more because we're, we're outdoors. There's that constant dilution of fresh air, and that may actually be as powerful or more powerful than changes in UV or temperature. All right, then we have to make the most of the summer months ahead and hope for a sunny winter. Dr. Charlotte Holdcraft from the University of Cambridge, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. And now it's time for your questions. Over to our science correspondent, Derek Williams. If COVID-19 invades many bodily fluids and organs, is it possible for it to enter a fetus? Though there's still a lot we don't know about the virus in the field of, of reproductive medicine, at this stage, the chances of a mother passing it along to an unborn child appear to be very low. And in, in one study that looked at 38 expectant Chinese mothers who became infected with COVID-19, none of the babies that were subsequently born tested positive for the virus. Um, another that tracked 33 pregnant women in China confirmed that three of the babies born to them also tested positive for the disease, but as all three were delivered by cesarean section, it was unclear whether they caught it before, during, or after birth. So even if the virus does cross the placenta in some cases, it would seem to be a, a pretty rare event. There are hot spots in the meat industry in the US and Germany. Is that because meat products can be contagious? Workers at meat packing plants in many countries have been coming down with COVID-19 in, in far greater numbers than, than people who work in other industries. So, so what's going on? Um, like so much about this disease, it, it still isn't, isn't really clear, but there are, are plenty of guesses. One involves proximity. Workers in meat packing plants spend a lot of time close to each other, working fast, and, and the work can be physically very taxing. Um, many people will be breathing hard. It, it probably isn't easy to keep protective gear like, like masks in place, and, and social distancing is very difficult. The, the low temperatures in facilities also probably play a role. The virus likely remains viable for longer at low temperatures. Experts therefore believe that the problem isn't that meat 
can carry the contagion, but instead a whole range of, of other issues surrounding this kind of work. Do lipid levels increase during active COVID-19? Interestingly, several studies have so far shown that it actually appears to be the opposite. Um, one that looked at blood work performed on nearly 600 patients discovered that not only does cholesterol in the blood sink in patients who have COVID-19, how far it drops also seems to correlate with disease severity. Uh, some experts even now believe lipid levels could be used to predict how badly someone is going to react to getting COVID-19. Um, the question is, is, is why do those levels drop? Um, one theory is that cholesterol from the blood is being loaded into various tissues, and, and that's contributing in some way to the deadly progression of the disease. That might, for example, explain why older people who, who start out with high levels of cholesterol are so much more affected than, for example, kids who generally have, have low cholesterol levels. It's an interesting working hypothesis, I think, but it's, but it's still unproven. It's not just disinfecting robots using ultraviolet light to, uh, who are gaining their place in the sun. The need for social distancing means service robots are starting to become more popular too. Now, these two work in a Chinese restaurant in the Netherlands. With the touch of a button, they deliver orders to tab tables. Reactions from diners have, however, been mixed with some enjoying the novelty and others bemoaning the lack of interpersonal contact. And we still don't know if they need to be tipped.